Okay, we're live. All right, so let me share my screen. Let's show the animation and get started. We'll just start right off with that. Welcome to the 2006 First Robotics Competition in this year's game, Aim High. This year's game is played on a 26 by 54 foot field. Three goal openings are located in each alliance station wall through which your opponents will be able to score. Above each center goal is an illuminated target that is used by the automated vision system to determine range and location of the goals. A platform in front of each alliance station wall is used at the end of the match by robots when they climb upon it and score bonus points. The objective of the game is simple. Shoot, push, or roll balls through any of the three goals at the far end of the field. At the end of the match, you have your three robots on your ramp in front of your alliance station. The match starts with a 10 second autonomous period in which robots will attempt to score using just pre-programmed instructions. Each robot can start with up to 10 balls in their possession. Robots can use the onboard vision system to determine the location of the upper center goal. After computing a trajectory, balls are shot through the goal opening for higher point values. Whichever alliance scores highest during the autonomous period earns a 10 point bonus and their goal is turned off in the next period of the game. At the end of the autonomous period, human players step forward and take over the controls for the remainder of the game. In this case, the blue alliance robots are on offense and will attempt to score through any of the goals. The red alliance robots will attempt to defend the goals to the best of their ability to keep the blue robots from scoring. Robots can restock their supply of balls by either picking them up from the field surface or receiving them directly from human players. At all times during this period, one robot from the defending alliance must remain at the far end of the field and cannot cross the midfield line. For the next period of the game, the roles are reversed as the offensive alliance goes on defense and vice versa. Thus, every robot will have to have both good offensive and defensive capabilities. Robots will also have to be robust to withstand impacts from other robots and the occasional flying ball. During the final period of the game, both goals are turned back on and both alliances can score. During this last 40 second period, teams will need to keep a careful eye on the clock. They want to score as many points as possible while leaving themselves enough time to get back to their own end of the field and put one, two, or all three robots up on the platform for bonus points. In this match, Red wins the 10 point economy bonus. Each alliance gets one point for every ball on a corner goal and three points for every ball on a center goal. Red has all three robots on the platform for a 25 point bonus and wins the match 74 to 70. Good luck and we'll see you at the competition. All right. So welcome to Stipol's history lesson with me, Mr. Blay. And joining me tonight is Paul, who's over here, I guess. Hey, guys. Uh, um, so Paul was the president, co-president? Co-president, co right? Co-president of the team in 2006, and he was also the operator of the robot. Um, so yeah, let's just jump right into it. I forgot how boring those animations were. It's truly the greatest of CGI that was available at the time. <laughs> but it's just like they got the least charismatic guy to do it, and it just like sounded so yeah, I, going through it so slowly. All right, so um, Paul, so I we were talking before this, before I started recording. You actually didn't even remember, but I was on the team. This was my freshman year. <laughs> when you don't have to repeat that. Thing. You were a senior. Okay. Everyone was important to me at the time, I swear. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about kind of what your initial thoughts were, what the team's initial thoughts were on that kickoff day, kind of what it looked like um, in case like things were a little different back then? Well, so I think I don't have the greatest feel for how the team is structured now, but generally speaking, I think we were a little bit smaller, uh, a little more inexperienced to the team. We'd only been around for five years at that point, I think. Um, and, and so – we kind of made a, a couple mistakes. Uh, I would say, generally speaking, we definitely had a tendency to overestimate our capabilities. Um, like every now, team does. As every team does. I'm, I'm sure that hasn't changed that much. Um, and so, specifically with this game, we, we really thought that going for the center hoop was kind of the be it and end all. 
you know, um, if you look at the design for Joshua, you can kind of see that we've definitely emphasized that element of the game, possibly at the expense of being more effective at moving balls into those lower goals. Um, and so that was probably one, one facet of just the, how we were, our headspace at the time and, and how that drove our decision making process. Um, you know, there were definitely robots at the time that did a much more, better job of just basically pushing balls into that uh, lower goal area. Here's the robot. If you, can you see that, Paul? Yeah, I can see that. Okay, cool. And, and so I, I have guess, two pictures. <laughs> yeah, it's better than I have laying around. Yeah. Um, so just as just sort of to provide some background, I guess for the what our approach was, because I imagine this robot's not around anymore. It uh, actually is. It actually is around. Oh, it actually is. It does That's, not work, but it exists. Well, that, that would be surprising if it did. Um, I'm surprised you guys have a space for that. Um, I scratched and clawed for it. So basically, if you look at the mechanisms that we have in place, we have a essentially a roller in the front that serves to suck up balls and direct them into this spiral that's in the center of the of the robot. Um, the the balls are pushed up the spiral through a set of ro uh, revolving brushes in the center, and then from there are pushed into the flywheel, which is basically just a big rubber wheel that we would um, you know aim towards the 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 center goal in order to achieve points. I remember on kickoff um, that Sammy had this idea of just doing like a big box. He called it, he called it a big hopper and I never heard that term before. That was the first time anyone had said the word, the term hopper to me. I remember going like, what's a hopper, what's that? Uh, now, I hear, now, brain fellows, I guess. now I hear it all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, this idea of just a roller and a hopper and just go in the low goal. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is in, the, in New York City, I'd say that the best robot or one of the best robots was literally that. Yeah, I think I think if we had done like an what they call an expected value calculation, where you essentially say what's the probability of you getting the balls into the center hoop times the the points you get for each ball, and then we had, if we had compared that to just dumping all the balls in the lower hoop, you would have seen a much higher expected value associated with just the simple mechanism. Yeah. Um, especially with the we didn't have. And I don't want to, you know, speak ill of anyone. We didn't have the strongest programming core at the time. You know, we had three or three or so guys, three or four guys, that were involved in it. Um, and so, getting the computer vision aspect of aligning the robot towards the green light was challenging, and we never really got that to work all the way. I think we did it for autonomy, but we couldn't get it to work during the actual game. Um, and then, the way we set up the mechanism, where we had to move the entire robot to align the the, the flywheel with the with the goal, um, kind of kind of inhibited our ability to actually score points using that center hoop. And in light of those limitations, it probably would have been better just to go and just dump all the balls and score a ton of points, and you know, and be like really capable at that. Yeah, it's always better to be like really good at a lesser thing than. Eh. Another, another part of and that was kind of a theme of of um, the early days of Sky Pulse. When when the game involved a lot of different moving elements, we had a tendency of latching on to the high scoring things. Um, but we really did want to try to be good at everything. And a lot of times, unless you have a very large team, it's hard to be good at everything. And so you got to make your you know some triage choices essentially. Yeah, you have to decide what your limits are. Yeah. Um, one thing that I think we missed really early on was the importance of human player loading. Like, we were kind of capable of it. But, you know, let me share the uh, picture again uh, of the robot. So, yeah, we were kind of capable of it. But it was incredibly difficult to load balls into that hoop. Like, shockingly difficult. Do you well, remember that? Yeah, yeah. We, we put that, that grass sort of looking thing in an effort to dampen out the balls going into the hopper mechanism or into the spiral mechanism. But the, the way it's set up, it's kind of intrinsically not really designed to support that loading capability. You know, we, we had a very centralized concept of suck up balls, load them into the spiral, and then shoot them out. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think like 
I don't think we thought a lot about like the phases of the game and how that worked. Cause as the game progressed, the strategy kind of moved more towards, okay, you score an autonomous. If you score more points in autonomous, that means you're on offense second. It's so, like, while the other alliance is on offense, you go back to a human player, load up. Or it's like, whenever your, your defensive period is, you go to the human player and you, you get as many balls as you have over there. Yeah, I think we, we really focused on what we perceived to be, you know, the, the goal of just scoring as many points as possible through that center hoop and kind of always being on offense. Um, and I think we, that was to our detriment, ultimately. Um, again, we, we didn't really map out how points would be allocated, and, and we didn't really have a, like a coordinated game plan for the entirety of, of, the, of the game as it unfolded. Yeah. I felt like, you know, especially at that point in our team, we just kind of were like, here are tasks, let's do tasks. Yeah, I mean, I'd say generally we didn't really have the strongest like organizational focus at the time. Things were sort of, uh, you know, kind of roughly delineated and people would work on their own sort of individual systems and things integrated on the actual robot well enough. But um, yeah, there wasn't like a cohesive plan in, in regards to the game plan or even really the, the, the design of the robot sometimes. Yeah, so let's, let's talk a little bit about robot design. A lot of kids always ask me, they look at the shooter on Josh and they're like, they see the motor floating in space. Do you remember how that? Yeah, I remember that mechanism. <laughs> you talk a little bit about how that works? Worked. Well, the basic idea was that we took a, we called them Fisher Price motors at the time. We took the, the gearbox off the motor and we basically just drove the wheel using the motor with, with, with um, just like a hub mounted on the motor. It was a purely friction driven mechanism. Yeah. So and, today, like we can, like we can just buy stuff where you can easily mount a, a wheel to a motor, no problem. But back then it was not so easy. You had like literally a toy car motor. Yeah. Yeah. Things were a little more improvised. Uh, I mean, it, it kind of, let's put it this way. When, when, when hand drill motors and their gearboxes became uh, a big part of it, it uh, uh, part of the drivetrains that you saw a lot, it totally changed the sport because you could get uh, easy gear shifting. And even that was pretty improvised because there's a little servo that would do the, you know, basically moving the hand drill gear. And, and so, I mean, just generally speaking, we, our machine capability was much more limited. The out of the box hardware was much more limited. Uh, I mean, you know, like you said, the, the, the Fisher Price was out of the, like, out of the little plastic, uh, you know, ride along toys that the kids have. And so there wasn't um, anywhere near the degree of sophistication. I think they, they had just started doing like kit chassis with the robots. I don't, I don't know that they even started. Did they do them th uh, already? I feel like yeah, it was still a couple the, years. The year before, Yvette did a kit chassis. Uh, yeah. And so here's the Fisher Price motor. I mm -hmm. believe. Um, yeah, yeah, that's definitely, yeah, that's bringing back some memories. And so we basically just uh, pulled out the, the, you know, the actual motor element. And in part because we wanted to have a relatively light design. In part, we wanted to keep it simple. We basically just took that motor off, just took up a, an aluminum ring, mounted on the motor end with a pure friction fit. And, and for what, what it needed to do, it was fine. But it, it certainly uh, wasn't precision engineered, let's put it that way. No, I don't think there was ever an encoder on it. <laughs> no, no, there was nothing like that. Um, I think the, the the equivalent today would be, the, I don't, you don't know these, but for the kids, you know, it's the 775 motor. So this was kind of like that second motor. The, the best motor, I believe, do we have the sim motor already or was it the mini bike motor? The, the sim motors were, yeah, we used those for the, the gearbox, the almost always the drive systems. So, uh, do, you, you have those. do you want to talk about the drive system? Because I know the, I actually don't even know the full scope of it, but I know there was a lot of evolution of the drivetrain throughout the season. Yeah. So the original intent was to utilize tank treads, um, and how much of that was really driven by the needs of this game. And how much of that was more of an attempt to sort of build the capability in the organ in the team? I'm I'm having a hard time really drawing a distinction at this point. You know, we we had seen 
Other teams, uh, specifically McKee, I'm not even sure if they're really a big player anymore in the... I think some of our kids know who they are, the Robo Wizards. Yeah, the Robo Wizards. They had been a, a pretty consistently effective team back then because they, they could build the hell out of a out of a tank tread system. They were world champs. Were they world champs? In 2006, they were world champs. I mean, oh, they were well, the second pick. But yeah, they were the world champs. They played really good defense. Well, and so and so that was kind of something that we we learned. Like, they were because they had always a solid drive train and tank tread. They were always very capable of just essentially dealing with that element of the game, either either playing defense or just, you know, manipulating other robots, you know, doing that sort of thing, right? Um, and so we wanted to be able to kind of hold our own in that regard, be able to, uh, you know, not get, not, not get pushed around by other teams. I think we perceived that it would be important to, once you're in the right orientation with the robot, stay there. Yeah, I think, you know, this game did not have any protected zones, so... I remember us really being like, we need to be high traction. No one can move us. But then as I, like, I progressed through my time in FRC, I'm like, well, actually, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. If, and, and actually, I think it wound up hurting us because, we couldn't turn. as it turns out, when you have a tank tread system, it's hard to turn. And getting especially into the right orientation is difficult, yeah. especially when you don't have any sort of like driver assist with the uh, alignment with the, that central hoop. Yeah. Um, so I think, do we? How many iterations of the drivetrain did we go through? I, I, I don't recall specifically. I know that we we were originally going to do the tank treads, and I, we were going to do like a, a gear shifting mechanism on the treads. Because um, we had done on the previous year, we had done a very successful, very simple gear shift by using a set of V belts, and then I actually, actually physically pull moving that the up. motors. I actually pulled that up because Ian posted that way back in the day on Chief Delphi. Oh, wow, yeah. I can maybe find an image of that. And so we, I think our original intent was to utilize a, a gear train system that had, had that shifting mechanism and also a set of tank treads for the, you know, the actual you know, interface with the ground. And I think the tank treads went first. We had problems not only you know, manipulating the robot in that circumstance, but also just manufacturing problems, just getting the seam of the treads to evenly come together. Because, uh, you know, when you have those really long belts, the manufacturer often doesn't just, you know, doesn't seal it up for you. You have to go and attach the two ends together. And that wound up being a, you know, a reliability issue. Um, and then, I don't know why we went to, I'm trying to remember why we went to a chain-driven system on the drivetrain. Um, I think I it think was, it, I think it was just like the lead time on belts were just insane back then. So yeah, like, was that what it was? I mean, I don't, I don't really know because I, I was a freshman. I wasn't really part of any of those decisions. But I do know mm -hmm. that before the year, I want to say like 2011, the lead time on belts was insane, like two weeks. Yeah, a lot, a lot of – these specialty parts were definitely harder to get your hands on. Um, you know, basically, if you couldn't get it up from McNaster, it was pretty much good luck getting it. Um, but, yeah – at any, at any rate, for either just because we were down to the down to the wire, or we couldn't get the shifting mechanism to work right, we eventually went to this heavy chain system that we have there, uh, which you know was reliable, which was obviously the most important thing with the drive train. It actually um, looks like there's a V belt on one side and a 35 ANSI chain on the other. Interesting. I'm not sure if we did that. That's that's a that's an interesting choice. Um, I know the one one development in the drivetrain that wound up being very important that came later was we didn't originally have omni wheels on the on both sets of the front and back. Um, we originally just had four wheels that were all the same rubberized material, and it was almost impossible to turn the robot in that circumstance. Um, and going to omni wheels actually really facilitated the the shooting element in terms of aligning the robot. But it also meant that anyone could just push you around. Um, and so it was double-edged, but it was a necessity at that point. Yeah. Also, I don't think many people were pushing us, trying to. We probably weren't worth it. <laughs> Although at the end of New York, maybe. Yeah, we, we, we were the, what, the, the first pick of the alliance? I don't remember if we were the first uh, or second pick. And I think we were the first pick of our alliance in New York. Yeah. We did um, reasonably well that year. We did okay. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. It was awesome. It was my freshman year. I was very excited. I got my medal and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Okay, so I think the mechanism that a lot of people always ask about is the spiral. Mm. Um, like just now in the chat, Jeremy asked, like, we had a spiral, no one told me. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the spiral, kind of where that idea came from, the evolution of it, maybe some of the prototyping of it? Yeah, so I think one thing that we were concerned about was uh, jamming of balls and, and wedging of the balls. I mean, if you felt them, they're like a sort of soft foam rubber. Um, yeah, we actually so, had a very similar game piece this year um, that was kind of same-ish material, same-ish size. I'd be, so I'd be curious then to see how you guys dealt with them. But we were worried that if you had a, just like a, a, a big hopper, right, we were worried that, that and especially if we were trying to feed the balls into, into a flywheel mechanism or, or some sort of, you know, cannon style, you know, firing mechanism. We were worried about jamming and, and getting, not being able to um, sort of properly modulate the rate of balls that were going through. And so it was kind of, and, and augers don't actually work this way, it's kind of the other way around where the auger spins uh, as opposed to the, the center shaft spinning. But we were kind of inspired by an auger where you can sort of, and this is used in a lot of industrial applications to move, you know, sort of pellets and things like that. Um, you know, like sort of, uh, you know, granular material. Can you um, see that? I'm sharing an R or no? Uh, I can see the robot still. Oh, well, I got to change the screen share. Hold on. Let me share my screen and that'll be easier. Okay. Yeah. Can you see now? Yeah, okay. And so, um, and so it, obviously in this circumstance, it's the, the spiral that spins as opposed to, you know, the, the center shaft that spun relative to the spiral. Uh, we weren't going to have the full spiral spin. That would be ridiculous, right? Um, but the idea was basically the same. Right? By 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 spinning the by the sort of having a clear track where the balls could go up, we could very uh, easily modulate the pace of the balls going through the system, and that would ensure that we never got balls jammed into the into the flywheel, and that we wouldn't see jams on the other side when we were spinning it out because there's a drum on the front of the robot that was how the balls are picked up and, and released in the front. Um, the downside of this mechanism was that it, it has a very limited throughput. And so, you know, if you're a big hopper, right, you can just dump all the balls or pick up all the balls very quickly. In this circumstance, you kind of get the, you got to roll the ball all the way up the spiral and you know, that winds up limiting the amount of balls that you can go through the system at a time. There's a long time to get from the bottom of the spiral to the flywheel. So if you're not, if you're not fully up, you have to sort of actively manage the, the spinning of that so that you have the balls close to the flywheel. The interesting thing is there's actually like, so when we did this, I don't think there had been really many spirals used in FRC, especially of this kind. I think this was like really an original idea for our team. Like, do, do we steal from anyone or do we just think of this? I, I do not recall. I mean, like, yeah, I can't think of anyone that, that was doing it at the time. So, you know, nowadays, ever since, so I think there were a bunch of teams that did something similar in 2006. Um, but it's like a lot more teams do this now. Really? Yeah, there were a ton in 2009 of, a few in 2012, not as much because you can only, there was a limit. This year there were some. Um, and actually, you know, I think a big part of our problem with, you know, our throughput speed had to do with um, just like grip on the ball in the spiral. Mm. Like I think balls would get missed. Um, like feed of the ball into, like from the top into the shooter because balls would sometimes, you know, miss the feed going in. Mm. And then I think this is just the gearing and the speed and just the motors we had. But like today, you know, there are robots where it's a spiral that big and it's one, two seconds and it's empty. Yeah, no, so we, we originally set it up so that it'd be a brush that pushed the ball. Basically, we were very paranoid about jams. And I think I rightfully that, so. Yeah. I mean, if, obviously, if it jams, your strategy is, is done, right? Mm -hmm. But I think in the grand scheme of things, that risk was probably not worth the amount of mitigation we put into it. Because the balls are pretty big, right? And there isn't that much free space in the spiral for them to, to you know, get wedged into. You know, and, and so obviously, you know, hindsight's 20-20, um, but, you know, if we had a more active interface, 
you know, an actual sort of, you know, physical interaction with the, uh, between the ball and the, the central column that was spinning the, the, the ball up the spiral, that might have been uh, more effective. Yeah. I mean, but the spiral was really, really interesting. I mean, it didn't work super well, but I think we were just like, didn't have a lot to work with. It was, I think like we inspired a bunch of teams to do it in future years. Cause we were, uh, if you recall, we were featured in that book after we won the creativity award in New York. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Right I don't now? remember that book. No. So there was this time. book, they put all the creativity award winners from that year into the book. Uh, and our spirals is featured in it. And I just got a message from Seth Berg. He took a picture of the book because he has the book. He took a picture of all the pages. And I'm going to screen share those right now. Oh, for you cool. To look at. Yeah. I actually. And I, I will say the, this. I, I think that mechanism, it, it, for what it was designed to do, it was very robust. It was very well executed. I just think our strategy um, wasn't in line with sort of the optimal approach to the game. Yeah. I think that's accurate. Um, Okay, here we go. It has like all our prototyping stuff too. Okay, so here's a picture of the robot. You can kind of see it. Um, all right, let's keep going down. As you can see the early prototyping of the mm -hmm. spiral. Hey, there's Jay Walker. That is Jay Walker. Is that next to, is to Joe Ricci? He's right next to Joe Ricci. Let's see if I can zoom in on this at all. If I download the images. Oh, God. Oh, that was too much. Didn't let me do that. Okay. You can kind of see some of the CAD stuff. Now, did you work on the CAD with Ian? Is that right? Oh, I wasn't really involved in the CAD stuff. I didn't have, I didn't really develop CAD skills until I, um, until I went to college. Okay. And so Ian still did a lot of the CAD stuff. Um, Can you tell, because uh, the kids don't know who Ian is. Oh, Ian was the president the year before I was around, um, or before I was president, rather. Uh, yeah, he was around when I was around. Um, and so Tom still mentors, right? Yeah, Tom still mentors. The kids know who he is. Yeah, and so Ian is Tom's son. And that's why Tom's around, because, you know, his kids were involved in it back in the day. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, you know, even still, a lot of the design work was, was done. We didn't have a whole lot of... Um, CAD, CAD capabilities in the in the team at the time, and so a lot of the design work was done, like conceptual work was done, uh, you know, like on a whiteboard, or, you know, through conversations, and then things were ultimately hashed out as best they could in the CAD environment. Um, and I remember these little flaps that we made, that were attached with Velcro because you had to unload the balls. Oh yeah, yeah. And you couldn't, we couldn't turn the thing by hand. I believe we used a window motor for the spiral. Is that correct? I think so. Because that was uh, what prevented us from turning it, turning it by hand. Yeah, it was also. I think it was also gear reduced. Yeah, so a window motor is a has a worm box, so it can't. You can back drive it with enough force, but it really is difficult to back drive. It's like a one to twenty four reduction. So like yeah. you're not gonna do it. It's really hard. It's really yeah. difficult. It's not even in the reduction. It just like adds to it because it's just it, it's um. They use a worm, don't they use a worm gear in a, in like a car jack? Yeah, yeah, I mean basically like it's, uh, yeah, 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 that's how it works. Um, yeah, it's uh, basically any mechanism where you just really do not want to have to be back driven. Um, and for what it's worth, I, I don't know that we picked that motor because it was really essential in this application so much as it didn't really require any additional gear reduction. And, you know, we had kind of used a lot of the better motors or the more appropriate motors like the drivetrain and, you know, other applications. Yeah, so they actually um, don't limit uh, your motors anymore like they used to. Oh, well, that's good. Yes, yeah, so you can use unlimited motors. Their only limit is the number of slots in your... Um, You're in your controller. Uh, in your, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's called a PDP. Power distribution panel. Mm. Okay. Um, so yeah, going back to those flaps though, if I can get this to work. Here we go. Uh, I remember there was a match, like there were a couple matches where these would just fall off because they were attached with Velcro. Uh, yeah. I actually have a video I'm going to show a little later where the balls just kind of blow out. 
it, it does kind of undermine the uh, effectiveness of the spiral when yeah. you lose half the balls at the side. Um, so yeah, the lesson there is for something like that, don't use Velcro. No, no, <laughs> um, I mean, an actual active connection. Yeah, I believe um, we changed to wing nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a good call. Um, um, yeah, the other thing about the spiral that was just cool from a purely aesthetic standpoint was that it, it took a lot of really uh, intensive sheet metal work. And so um, uh, Theo and Ron, I don't know if Ron's still around. Ron is around, yeah. Okay, so Theo was Ron's, Ron's daughter, spent a lot of time uh, like getting very good at sheet metal work, which, um, you know, again, it, it, it does, it, it's always good to have a design that's focused on manufacturability, let's put it that way. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, th that spiral was super, in terms of just the sheet metal, of that oh, they did an excellent super cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else we got. That's it for the photo from that book. Um, but I actually, you know, when we get back in the lab, uh, I have this book so you guys can take a look at it um, in person. And Seth's going to scan them in and I'll send those out as well. Okay, cool. Um, the one, the, so there was actually one thing that I worked on on the robot when I was a student. As I, I was introduced to Joe Ricci. I, I, don't, I don't remember if it was you or someone else who told me to work on a camera mount. Yeah, you, I don't recall specifically. Do you recall what the camera mount looked like? That I actually don't remember. No. Okay, so let me see if I can pull up. Oh, I killed the photos. Um, I need a producer. Okay. Uh, so the camera mount, it's got a servo going this way. <laughs> And it's oh wow! <laughs> so like, hey, it if it works, you, it works, right? It did not work. <laughs> well, never mind then. But I built these Lexan covers so the camera would be perfectly protected. It didn't matter. We didn't have any software for any of this anyway. No, no, it didn't. Like the camera <laughs> side, I don't even know if we would have been able to get the servos to move. <laughs> if we had an autonomous mode. Was it just dead reckoning based? I think it was just go forward, shoot. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I think we also had an autonomous that was trying to crash into our opponents. Nice. That's like a real jerk strategy. Um, if it works, though, it works. I mean, hey, if it makes you feel any better, Joe, the flywheel was literally mounted on a bunch of like aluminum tubing that me and my dad sort of bent into shape until it fit. So. All right. Not, not, not for such engineering, don't worry. All right, I have the one match video from 2006 we're gonna look at right now and you're in it in, in all of its like eight pixel this is what 2006 looked like everything, everything was pixelated back then kids everything, everything. was in 144p uh, all right so let's I'll, I'll jump around a little bit Uh, video. Oh, yeah. Let me mute it. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we still have that flag. <laughs> oh, man. That robot car looks pretty good. Should have kept that. It's important to be good at some things. All right, let me fast forward a little bit. Okay, here's Nathan Bixler with his red hair chanting 694. Oh, my God. <laughs> And Ian was the drive coach? Um, was he in the drive coach that year? I think so, yeah. I think he was, it was, yeah, it was it, I was the secondary operator. Um, it was jo Josh Badovsky was the primary operator. And then, yeah, I think Ian was the drive coach. What was the deal? Because he was a junior, and I noticed he was just like, he just like disappeared from the team uh, the next year. Uh, if he, he was a junior when I was a senior. Right. So why he left afterwards, I don't know. Okay, just curious. Okay, so I'll fast forward through this part because you can't really see the match. You can just kind of see the drive team jump to the next match. Yeah, it's like a really detailed view of our backs, which isn't that exciting. You can see our, our crew here. You know, I remember we weren't allowed to like bring that many people to Hartford. It was like maybe 20 people. Yeah, I don't know why that was. See, like, because I wanted to go and I wasn't allowed to. 
So I was very sore about that. I don't know. I don't know what that was about. All right, here's a different match. Are we in it? Okay, here we go. All right, here goes autonomous. I think this is the video where this is our autonomous mode. Oh man, in all its glory. This is, I think this is my favorite, one of my favorite all time 694 videos. And the balls flow out the side. <laughs> uh. I think this was with the original drivetrain. But actually, you know, so this was from Hartford, which was our first competition. By New York City, we can actually like do some scoring. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, going through the Omni wheels actually really helped us a lot. Um, and you kind of get into the cadence of how to, you know, manipulate the robot to score points. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think the teams that did well either either had on, on scoring in the center hoop, either had some sort of like driver assist to orient the the sh their their shooter relative to the the uh, the hoop using the camera, or they individually independently articulated the the shooter because. Moving the whole robot just didn't wind up being feasible. Yeah, that's interesting. I actually don't think that's necessarily true because the goal is so big. Yeah, but we, we couldn't hit it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I think that's because part of that was because our shots was like one was here, and then one was there, and then one was there. One was well, there. so going with the um, you know, going with the 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 flywheel mechanism that was driven by a friction interface was that was problematic because you kind of can't maintain a consistent speed on the flywheel. Also the inertial difference between the flywheel and the ball that you're moving compared to the actual motor was pretty significant. And so you just scrub away so much energy each ball you shoot. It's hard to maintain a consistent you know, also output the, velocity. Also the physical shooter mount is on a spring and backs off of. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, basically every, every kind of like recoil you had, it would, it would bounce off. Yeah, so um, as a ball passed through, you was just like so inconsistent. I think that was, in my opinion, that was like the biggest problem with the with our shooting was that we had no idea where the ball was going to end up. Yeah, it, like honestly, unless you have have gone down in the field, though, it just it's just hard to know where the robot's really oriented, and that was just an important element of it. Like you basically always had a warning shot, you had to fire in order to orient the robot, and that's a lost ball, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, and then if someone hits you, you get all you're off you get off kilter. Now, the interesting yeah, thing I mean, is, you know, back then CV was so hard. Yeah. No, computer vision has come an insanely long way in the last few years. Um, like my understanding is that there's even some teams that do like lidar stuff, right? Yeah. That which is insane. You know, back then pretty that was like the purview of, of like you know graduate students only, pretty much. Yeah. And there's like so many libraries today. You can just basically buy a working working CV in a box. Yeah, I mean, really honestly, a, a lot of the problems we had with autonomy, especially, was that you had to go build your own code base, right? And because we didn't have that much experience with feedback, never mind like you know multiple feedback sources. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we were really dependent on on running our autonomous mode on the robot that we had when it was done. Which you can't do if the robot is done, you know, two days before you ship, right? So, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of challenges there. Yeah. Um, okay, so C Connecticut was a struggle. I don't believe we made eliminations. Is that correct? I don't think so. I don't remember. I don't think so. Yeah. So it's not on, it's not online. Like the information on that competition is just not on the internet. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I believe we did not make eliminations. Yeah, which I, don't I think was doing a, that well. I think it was a regular, pretty much a regular occurrence. We didn't really make eliminations that much outside of New York City back then. Yeah, I mean, let's see. Oh, outside of New York City, yeah, definitely not. Every year, we've always made eliminations in New York City every year of our history. Yeah, it wasn't the strongest competition. No. But then we went on to New York City. New York City was super fun because it was my first competition. I'd never been to any oh, kind yeah, of yeah. competition before. And I remember I was in the stands just going absolutely hog wild every time we were on the field, like banging on anything I could find. Um, oh my god! Um, so yeah, do you want to talk about a little bit about New York City, kind of how that went, how far we went? Which yeah. Were? So um, I, I believe that we were—I forget if we were in the the 
what the top eight would pick with Foreign Alliance, if that yeah, memory serves. Eight. Yeah. I forget if we were in the top eight in our own right, but we were the we were the first pick of like one of the top four, I think. Yeah, I um, think it was. And again, it was, with seven, of, it was it was with um the British team, right? Because we were yeah, yeah, yeah. with them. Yeah, we had a we had a decent connection with them. Like one or two times when they came, we would hang out with them. You know, um, I don't know if they still come if, if there's a, a local. So they kind of so it was it was team seven five nine, mm. just a metric, and they. I don't know if they split off into other British teams or they just like cease to exist, but there's I don't think they exist anymore. They don't uh, that's okay. New York. There are some British teams who do come to New York still. So. Okay. But um but yeah, we have decent relationship with them just, you know, going back a couple of years. And like a lot of times you sort of you build relationships and rivalries with other teams. Um and so uh they picked us and I mean long story short, we were effective enough at that point at at most of the aspects of the game that, you know, and again, New York was not the most competitive regional, but, you know, we did okay. Um, you know, I, I don't really recall the the specifics of how we, you know, like, match the match how we did, but, uh, you know, we had kind of gotten shooting down. We had figured we'd get the autonomous to work sometimes. You know, we kind of muddled through at the end. Yeah, well, uh, I, I felt like we were one of, like, we weren't by any means the best team or, like, we were probably, like, Maybe the fifth or sixth best robot. Yeah, and I think we were in a position. I think we were in the top eight seeds. Yeah, uh, I, I believe so. Or we were like right on the edge. Yeah, something like that. You know, and, and a lot of times there's a certain amount of like luck associated with, with, with the seeding too, right? Sometimes you just get a bad draw. You know. Sure. Um. Yeah, and and again, like at least back then, the robot wasn't really done until. At least the, maybe the end of the second regional, maybe a little bit later, depending on the nationals or not. But there was a little more development time that happened after the robot shift. Yep. Um, so yeah, we made it to finals, which was awesome. Yeah, that's cool. And then, and then we got our doors blown off. <laughs> I mean, these things happen. Again, we we I think at the end of the day, our strategy was probably not the best given the resource limitation that we had. And also just the general layout of the game. You know, if we had focused more on really excelling at, an, at a, a source of guaranteed points, we probably would have been better off. Um, but again, we kind of overestimated our capabilities. But again, we, we did okay. We, we got decent at most things associated with the game. I mean, I was, uh, I remember, I walked out of there with my medal. I was on cloud nine. I had my silver medal. See, the problem, Joe, is my freshman year, we actually won the New York Regional. And so it's all, it was all downtown to that. <laughs> no, we didn't, we didn't deserve that win, though. But that was like. But I'd argue this robot was better than that one. That one could barely move. <laughs> again, not to, not to talk down to. Lola was not a good robot. <laughs> that was a. That we really got very ambitious, and, and we were not in a position to do that. But, um, but I'm you know. I'm hopeful to go back and get some more of you guys on there and do some of the robots. Oh, yeah, yeah. In the round four. <laughs> Um, um, but yeah, talk, talk to Ian. He'll attest to the challenge. I'm definitely going to definitely gonna reach out to him. Um, so actually, we won finalist website and Xerox at New York City. So, so that's pretty mm -hmm. good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we didn't qualify for, for champs. It was called nationals back then. Mm -hmm. That kind of sucked. But Yeah, I mean, sometimes you kind of get to take stock of what you're capable of. Yeah. Um, the year before with with Yvette, I think we actually built a hell of a robot, and we, we weren't rewarded on the regional level, but we actually got reasonably far in the in the competition at um, at nationals. You know, we, we got to, like, the semifinals of, of our bracket. Um, and that was, a, I think, honestly, a better robot. But, um, you know, it, it's important to understand what your strengths are and, like, you know, how you really stack up before you commit to going into the national league. I'm not sure if we even qualified at that, at that point. I'm not sure how what the qualification process was back then. So in 2005, we got it through chairmans. We oh, was that how it worked? In New York City, yeah. Um, in yeah. 2006, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't get any. And now, nowadays, there's a system where some finalists get spots. It's called the wild card system. Mm -hmm. Kind of like in, in baseball and other sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wild card slot. So there's like wild card slots of like some teams who weren't really qualified. So I think. Um, I think we might have, if the wild card system had existed that year, we might have qualified. Mm 
uh, depends on how our opponents had done. I believe, you know, we lost to two train and robotic plague, and I believe they both qualified already. Yeah, robotic plague was like our big rival back then. That was a, I don't know if it's still the case now. We they don't exist anymore. But they don't exist anymore. That's right. Yeah. Wait, what about definitely... Sunset Island Tech, right? Yeah. Yeah, the school still exists. They just don't the do robotics exists. anymore. Their uh, teacher retired, and no one really took a spot. Oh, that that yeah. sucks. Yeah. That was like an actual. We had a real rivalry with them. Yeah, we did. Yeah. It was like it was like a little bitter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean. You know, when you really care about something, you get emotionally invested in something. Yeah. You want to win. I just remember, like, as a freshman, they're like, other, other students were like, that's two train. We hate them. Like, All right, I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, they were so good. They had, like, they had the camera working. They, their shots were just like, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, no, we got school. But... And then two train was just a big box. With a, it, it even looked like an actual hamper, which is what I thought Sammy, <laughs> when Sammy first said hopper, I thought he said hamper. And it actually looked like a hamper. It actually looked like a hamper, yeah. It, had like, it looked like it had cloth on the side. But well, that was, was a pretty common little, design, wasn't it? Like basically like a laundry hamper. Yeah, but theirs was like, I think, you know, a lot of teams did something similar, but theirs was just the extreme of that. They were full dimensions, box, really fast output, really fast input, human player load, no problem. They were just like really consistent. Good. Yeah, they, they, they got that part points down. every time. Yeah, it was really impressive. Um, they used to be one of the best teams in NYC. They still exist, and they're still okay. But back then, they were like them and two train, uh, them and uh, plague. I feel like they were winning every year. I mean, a lot of it comes down to like individual mentors. Good. I think one of the only like really intergenerational aspects of the of a team. Mm -hmm. And you know, like you said, the the teacher retired for. Set Island Tech, okay, I can see that. And so that's not surprising that these things change over time, but yeah. That's and two train, two train, I think their lead mentor back then was Wayne Penn, um, who's still around in some circles. Some of our kids have met. I don't know if you remember him. I don't remember him. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, he uh they were I think they were really good when he was there. Okay, so uh, is there anything else you want to mention about our robot? Uh, I mean I think we've covered it, you know, more or less the the broad strokes and some of the details. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, again, I think I think the takeaway from this year wasn't so much like there were definitely failures along the way, in the sense of like drive train didn't really work out. Um, but I think at the end, Joshua was actually a fairly well constructed robot. It's it was really more a failure of of strategy when it came to like understanding how the game would be played and what the important elements of it were. It was fairly reliable. It was fairly, I wouldn't say necessarily capable, because again, we were trying to be a good shooting robot and we didn't really shoot that well. But you know, it was, it was fairly consistent and fairly capable in, in doing certain aspects of the game, but we just didn't really prioritize appropriately. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, you know, taking a closer look at the strategy, I think something we didn't really understand how to do that well back then. Oh yeah. But we learned a lot of lessons about, you know, well, you actually have to look at more closely at the rules. I think we more jumped into the conversation about what we wanted to do before we really understood the game. And that's something we do a lot better now. Yeah, I think, I think generally speaking, like we were much more, um, we didn't really have much of an organizational structure at the time. And we didn't really focus on the sort of intangible aspects of, of, the, of the sport. It was mostly just like, oh, we like building stuff. Let's go build stuff. Yeah. And I also felt like work. the conversation of like what the robot was going to look like was really a small, only like a small group of people really were involved. Well, that is, we definitely, the other thing that I, I, I yeah, I, I think it's worth mentioning is that we definitely had a very top heavy, uh, like design process, which I think was actually really to our detriment, especially as, uh, and I was mentioning this earlier to you, like the, the population of people that came in my senior year was pretty significant, uh, especially compared to previous years. And so we had a bunch more people, um, but we still had a fairly small pool of people making choices. And that didn't really, you know, it worked out in the sense that we, the, the parts that we did design interfaced well enough, but we didn't really have like the range of creative inputs that we maybe should have. And 
you know, we didn't really have the ability to scale the way we needed to, especially if we were going to be ambitious and, and try to accomplish these sort of more complicated tasks like autonomy. Um, yeah, so I think uh, what I want to do is um, I want to show a video from Einstein that year. Just like show some of the best robots, how what, what they look like. Maybe get some of your thoughts on them. Sure. I'm sure uh, your memory of them isn't super great now that you're an old man. Thanks. Um, thank you. Well, to, to, to these Bring kids, we're to these kids, we're super old. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, don't remind me. Yeah. Don't worry, you're not that old. I All right, here we go. Actually, before I start, if you look in the background here, this team's nine six eight. Now. Mm -hmm. Paul, do you remember the Cheesy Poos 254? Yeah, I remember Cheesy Poos, yeah. Okay, so they're they're like by far the best team in first now. They um, were pretty good back then too, but. Yeah, but it used to be 71. I, I think mm -hmm. back then was the best team, but now it's 254. And back then, they used to make the same exact robot as 968. They used to make clones every year. Really? Yeah, so 254 wrote 968. Now, there were a couple teams that did clones back then. It's not really, it's gone out of fashion now. But, but I guess, were they coordinated teams or were they? Yeah, so they would share CADs and they would like share mentors. Interesting. Yeah. So I just thought that would be, it. so it's like 254 isn't in this match of Einstein Finals 2, but you know, kind of are. They kind of are, yeah. are up 1 to 0. And on the right side, Team 296. Oh, they were world champs no. in 2019. The in the middle, Alliance. it's 217. The Thunder Chicken. And they're still really good. And rounding it out, oh, yeah. 522. And here's Mickey. Oh, oh, yeah, and so when, we, when we won in, 2000, in 2003, Mickey was the, was the captain of the team. And they became kind of the winner. And, and then we have Team 968. All right. So one of our mentors actually was a student. And rounding it up. 195. And 195 so they did was, was not actually that good. They were like the second pick of this alliance, but they're one of the best teams. One zero. Our committee's up. The finals. Ready in the blue. And the red. Three, two, go. Like very important was like who won autonomous because that decided who was on offense. Who's on the offense first? Yeah. Yeah. And you kind of see like the teams just rapidly unloading and there's a guy with a stick to unjam oh my god that's still a thing that's still a thing well yeah i mean it's always gonna be field field uh you know operators and... there's no matter how good the technology gets that's still a thing so red one auton which means blue is on defense first and you know red goes back to load up so that they can score right away as soon as their offensive mm -hmm. period starts and then 5 to 2 is just on defense. So you see right here, 217 is loading up. Oh, they yeah. Actually have, like, something a ton of balls in there. Yeah, they have a nice spiral here. They unload really fast when they score. Uh, and Blue is actually not on offense yet because they still need to load up on balls. Now they're finally there, and 968 is going to go ahead and score. And this design that 968 and 254 had that year is, like, one of the most imitated designs. It's just, like, year after year, this kind of shooter with a, with a hopper with it with sorry a uh, conveyor feeder yeah and it's basically it's very easy to get very rapid throughput because all your balls are at the base and then they get shot right up and you have the momentum to carry them forward yeah. that's pretty that, that's pretty clever yeah now you see some red bots they're kind of setting up to start to score to like line up and red red oh never mind red's already scoring and so they're mostly just they're, they're, most of these teams are still relying on the human operator to align. And there's McKee push, pushing robots around. Um, so what's actually kind of interesting is if you see where 217 is lined up, they mm -hmm. would always shoot from this corner. Oh, so are they keying off of like a, a, a piece of the field? Yeah, so they basically would drive up and they'd shoot from this spot. They did have a turret, but they would try to shoot from that same spot. Oh, that's actually really clever. Yeah, because it's hard to push them. The only issue with that is right now they're on red, they're scoring in the red goal, but they're on the blue ramp. So a team could trap them there. Sure. And then they can't get the points at the end or they can't right. get more balls. Right. But but even still, like it, it, it kind of serves to overcome the problems we had of actually aligning the robot. Yeah, it's always really good to uh, line up with a on a fixed target, fixed spot that you can't really defend against. Mm -hmm. Nine, six, eight's right up against the wall. They're just like right in front of and the yeah, wall. Yeah, they're just like dumping balls in there. Yeah. 
and 25 over here, they oh, could actually only yeah. human load. They couldn't even pick up off the ground, and they were one of the, the four champs. They hadn't lost a match. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of surprising because they don't seem to have that much capacity. Oh, no, but there's more capacity below, I see. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't really think too much about the uh, the human loading. Um, and honestly, that I think that has fairly consistently been, at least when I was around, that was something that we fairly consistently kind of ignored. But it's it's almost always the easiest way to get, you know, the set pieces of the game, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so there was a certain value in just, you know, having a person put in the robot. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the game. I think this one, real this game really lent itself more to it because you really wanted to load up in that downtime of defense, mm. the defensive period. Because really, it was a defensive period, but really, it's a load up period. You yeah, wanna, you can use that. You can use that quote unquote cool town time to your advantage. Exactly, because you especially you if you can go and, and dump all the balls into the into the center goal, like we like they did in the um, you know, when they were right up against the hoop. Yeah, and most teams, you know, the 10 balls they started with, those were gone by the end of auto. What do they do now? Well, if no one missed, there's no really balls on the ground. Even if people miss, they're like, not that many. Mm. But the balls you score go to your opponent, it's human player. So time to come back. Yeah, there's kind of a back and it's like a war aspect to it. Yeah, so that actually, that first section of the match, that first offensive period, didn't really have much scoring in it. Because both alliances would load up. The only thing is red would be able to score right away, but blue would have to wait till the end game, which was like a neutral period. Uh, and, and, you know, it's still regarded as one of the better games. A lot of people mm -hmm. really liked it. I thought it was super fun to watch, super fun uh, to be a part of. To, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I think most of the games that were around, the, of, the, of the games, I think this was one of the better ones when I was around. There was only one that was like genuinely not well thought out. 2003? But, uh, 2003 wasn't wasn't a good that wasn't a good game no no but um you knocked the most boxes over onto their opponent's side now and, that, and that's why mckee was mckee crushed it because they were just like going up the hill and then it was like basically king of the hill and <laughs> the best robot that year was literally a drivetrain with with ramps so that no yeah. one could, just, could go and then it's like just like knock all the boxes over and then you couldn't stack like a couple teams would stack the boxes internally and then it's like, congratulations, you've got a stack of like three boxes. And then people would yeah. come and knock them over. And someone's just going to mess with you again. Yeah, that was a bad game. <laughs> this game was good, though. Um, yeah. It was really yeah. good. It was, it was a fun time. Um, it was a fun year. Uh, okay, so now I'll look. We have some questions. Let's. If you have any questions, you can post them in the chat. Um, but something people asked, someone asked about before the call was uh, kind of, what your what what you did for college, where you went to college, Paul, um, what you what you ended up doing after college. So you want to kind of talk about that? We should sure, sure. That. So um, for my undergraduate, I I went to Carnegie Mellon, which is over in Pittsburgh. It's like a big robotic school. I don't know. Um, I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering. Um, then I worked for a couple of years. I worked for for Caterpillar, the the big industrial mining company. You know, makes the backhoes and diesel trucks and all that stuff. Um, and then I worked for, I worked in aerospace for a couple of years uh, for, a, they're called United Technologies Corporation. They're basically a supplier to the big names. They actually are pretty prominent at the Hartford Regional. Do you guys know yeah, that, I think they still sponsor first events. They definitely sponsored the Hartford Regional back in the day. Mm -hmm. And now I work for uh, for Siemens up in, up in Westchester doing a, uh, uh, basically, like diagnostic medical equipment, um, and and so my my role. I think my, they also uh, sponsor. By the way, I think Siemens also still sponsors first. Oh, that makes sense. They're like a big company, uh, but but uh, what I mostly work on uh, is feedback control systems and uh, simulation, which may be something that you guys don't have a whole lot of exposure to because it's not, you know, as involved in the first robotics world. But like, you know, if you guys utilize like PID loops in your mm -hmm. control and your yeah, so that sort of thing, but on, you know, large-scale systems. Um, and then I did my master's at, at Georgia Tech in electrical engineering. Cool. Can you actually talk for a moment? Because we do a lot of stuff with PID. How does PID, like, Oh, so how does it, job? so the, the basic idea is PID is proportional integral derivative control. Um, and the idea is basically that you've got an error, 
that you're trying to minimize over time. So you've got some reference. So let's just say it's like the orientation of a robotic arm, right? You want to maintain a certain angle. And so you're using either encoder feedback or, or potentiometer feedback. Uh, and what you're trying to do is basically get into that orientation. And so what you'll do is you'll look at your actual orientation and you'll calculate an error. Now that error uh, over time is basically then mitigated using the PID loop where you take the error, you multiply first by the, the proportional gain. So basically the amount of error in proportion is scaled proportionately. Then you have the integral gain where you're trying to integrate error over time. Then you have the derivative gain, which is basically looking at the rate of change in error. The idea is that you're basically looking to drive that error to zero and you're essentially taking these gains to translate in, you know, in this case, like motor current to achieve the desired orientation of the robotic arm. Right. Um, so like we do that kind of stuff with like our drivetrain and our shooters. Mm -hmm. um, what are kind of the more real world applications that you see in your job? Um, so, so I would say, I mean, a lot of those actually do translate kind of directly. So like, for instance, um, in my current job, uh, we, we do these uh, amino acids. So like, you're basically doing a lot of uh, chemistry to figure out if someone has hepatitis or, or whatever else, right? And so you have to precision orient uh, like a ring within, you know, plus or minus like a tenth of a millimeter. And so you've got an encoder on the ring and that's driven by a, a motor either via like a gear train or a belt or something like that. And basically you're trying to achieve a very specific orientation given the encoder position and you have the input current to the motor. And so in sort of the same way that you would do with a drivetrain, you're trying to drive that error to zero using these gains to dictate the desired current to the motor. Um, some other applications that I've worked on, you know, with, uh, with aerospace, I worked mostly on the, like uh, what they call the ECS, the environmental control system. So like the temperature and, and fresh air flow into an aircraft. Um, and so, you know, if, the, if the, the cabin of the aircraft is too warm, there are various thermodynamic systems in place that can be used to uh, essentially cool off the incoming air. And so in the same way, you're, you're trying to pick a target supply temperature to achieve a desired cabin temperature. Okay, uh, cool. So um, question from the chat, uh, how was build season structured back in 2006? And how did machining work back then? So I think so, in terms of how build season was structured, I think he's asking like, you know, how long do we prototype for? How long do we build for? How long do we program for? Stuff like that. So I, I would say prototyping it was roughly like a two week activity, maybe three if things didn't go well. Um, programming, we tried doing programming early on, but honestly, a lot of times we couldn't really begin um, until you had something of a functional robot in place. Um, you know, for the, for the, we didn't really have like a, a, a very in-depth API of functions already in place. And we definitely didn't have like prototype platforms for testing out the code in the same way. Like we had maybe like one or two like dummy robots that were a little more than just plywood boxes with wheels. Um, and so, you know, we definitely spent probably more time on the prototyping and, um, and, and sort of like this initial build than maybe we should have, because oftentimes those last three weeks, which were more about, you know, getting to the completion of the robot, were just a mad dash. Um, you know, I think we, we probably needed to spend a little more time just doing conceptual work, not even building something, and really planning things out in advance. And that was kind of like, like you mentioned before, Joe, that was like a weekend, right? where like some people would congregate, have a conversation, and then we'd start building a thing and we'd run into problems because we hadn't really gamed it out, you know, with, with a large number of people. Yeah, I also think just like not being able to fully CAD the robot made it really hard. Well, yeah, that was a real problem. Yeah. yeah I mean, we, we had a very, and I, and I guess this gets to another question about, the other question about, about machine capability. You know, we had a, a limited capacity in the sense that, you know, we had, you know, one or people that could do CAD work. We had some CNC capabilities with the, the old bridge port, which I don't even know, that's probably gone now. We still know, those bridge ports are good. We, I mean, uh, they're very good milling machines. They yeah. are we gave a them, programmed now. 
So we get into about, I think 2011, we, a few students and a few of the mentors really got to work on those mills to clean them up and get them working. And now we have full CNC capabilities on them where we're turning CAD into CAM into parts. That's pretty cool. I mean, we, the machines we definitely, were always fine. yeah, we, we, so we had some CNC, we had some people that could do the CNC programming and by some people, I mean one person. We had, we had basically one person who could Who do was it. that, by the way? It was, it was Victor Liu, the other president. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, we, we what I would call like the strategic capabilities that, uh, you know, really we could have leveraged more effectively. We just didn't train enough people because, you know, we just didn't have the bandwidth, I guess. Or we just didn't think to do it on like a, in, a, in a rigorous way. Yeah. You know? I also felt like it was just kind of this, like... Oh, that's for I can't, I'm not allowed to do that. Yeah. I think I think there was a little bit of protectionism there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. people definitely had their turf, and they uh, you know they wanted to stake it out. Um, I think also yeah, again, a lot of it was just we we were a very small team at one point, and people were kind of used to just like just doing stuff and not necessarily focusing on training because you know if you have five people, everyone's going to do something sooner or later, right? But as we grew, we didn't really think about how uh, how like the onboarding process would work. Yeah, like how, how it's usually just like organic, like everyone just does everything instead of well, how do we actually teach these these new kids? Yeah, and that was something that we just didn't think about at all. Uh, another question it was um, how was the team structured? I was actually about to ask the same thing. What was the structure of the team in terms of positions? The and you know we have marketing and we had um engineering and we had software but it was very different in terms of the structure so could you talk a little bit about yeah so i mean we kind of had two silos we had the engineering silo and we had the marketing silo right and the marketing folks um you know we had a president for marketing um it was it was Jones Lu when i was president so i think it wasn't a president for marketing because he was vice president oh was he vice president of marketing? so it was like you guys were co-presidents and he was just vice president of the team okay so we i guess we did that because we wanted two engineering presidents it, it had previously been two like kind of co-presidents marketing and, and and engineering um and so like sonia golance was was the the marketing president when we won chairman's that year in, in the year before in 2005 um and so then and then and, and so i guess when we went to, to we didn't want to have third presidents for whatever reason i'm not sure why who cares um but at any rate uh we did have like a vice president of engineering a vice president of marketing um, and then we, you know, we had like a, a field design, we had programming, we might have had, did we have like a director of engineering at time too? So the way I remember it, I don't think we had a vice president of marketing. I think we had the two presidents and a vice president and then we just had like seconds. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. And then we had a director of engineering, but it was unclear what that person did. It was basically a grooming position was the idea. Like yeah. Stephen, I think Stephen Lamb was Lamb. director. It was Stephen Lamb that year, right? And well, like, he, no, he might have been field construction. I don't think so. I remember Stephen being field construction at some point. He definitely wasn't his junior year. But we definitely had a field construction person and we had a director of engineering. Yeah, um, so the, the guy I think Poe might have been Poe might have been director of engineering. I thought she was vice president of engineering, but that might have been, she might have been, maybe we didn't have vice president of engineering, yeah. so we had two co-presidents. Yeah. She might have been director of engineering. Yeah. I think you're I, right. And, and we had a director of programming, which was kind of like, programming was a sub-team of engineering. Yeah, I mean, basically, and I think that was Josh Radofsky, who was the other driver that year. So I think we had like maybe two or three programmers back then. Oh, yeah, we had like three guys. That's yeah. it. Today, like, it's a whole I team. I think it was four with Danny Zhu. Yeah. He, now we have a whole team. It's a president, a vice president, they have positions under them. It's, it's, a, it's a whole, they have specific programming how mentors. Many, how many students is on your, are on your team right now? Are on the team or the program? Yeah. The so team, it's team. like, the team is probably like a little less than 100 kids, but 50 active, like very active kids. Okay. And yeah, so we probably have like 40 yeah. kids and like 20, like really, like maybe 30 really active kids. We yeah. were much smaller. Yeah. It really exploded, I think, in 2008. That's when we started really taking mm. on a lot of people. And then it, you know, had to flow. Um, um, and then, okay, another question we have. Uh, what do y'all think 
2006 would have looked like with current hardware and software, brushless motors, uh, vision in a box, unlimited motors, et cetera? Um, so for one, I think the, the distinction between, you know, they, had the, they wouldn't have had the light, obviously, for the computer vision aspect, because you can just identify the hoop. Well, now we do, we, they do retroreflective tape, and you emit in like an LED. Okay. But, um, but I think you would have seen, I think you would have seen a lot more of the scoring in the center hoop. By, and maybe not just by like teams who, you know, had a means of like orienting themselves. I think you would have seen a lot of sort of uh, essentially autonomously tracked camera or like a launchers where they could basically orient automatically in relation to the, the hoop. I think you probably would have seen a lot more scoring because it would be much easier to um, like automatically align in relation to that center hoop. Um, and I assume that, you know, there's enough onboard processing power to even like do the trajectory calculations. I think like if that game happened today, we would see full court shooters for sure. Oh yeah. Um, Cause it's just, it's, it's totally doable, especially that goal that big, like you could totally shoot full court. Yeah, I think so. And um, so you would have seen just ridiculously high scoring. I don't even think what the would game happen would. is the, the bottleneck <laughs> think... would have been getting the balls out of the human area back into the robot. Yeah. And it would have been just like back and forth. Like, like, like you said, Joe, basically just firing trajectories back and forth. I don't think the game would work. <laughs> it just, no, it would work. just be a constant stream of just balls going. I mean, I mean honestly, you'd probably run into problems where you would hit each other's balls in the way. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe you'd have like a space for just sort of the enforcer robot. Maybe that would have been a more important space because it's a kind of thing that's hard to deal with, even if you have a degree of autonomy. Yeah. But um, I think you probably wouldn't have seen a lot. Like the, the the strategy of just unloading the, the the balls in the sides would have been pretty pointless, I think. Yeah, I think that back then, because you know the robots moved a lot slower. Um, there were no bumpers, or there were bumpers, but they were. I think bumpers were new that year. Yeah, they were they were new that year and they were optional. Um, but they gave you 50 more pounds, so we added them for traction purposes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the games were a lot more like chess, where you're like making slow decisions and it's like, mm -hmm. or you're making a strategic decision, you're kind of like watching it play out and there really isn't, like there is a ton of interaction, but it's not like fast paced, whereas now it's more like a sport where it's just like everyone's kind of, the robots, you're making an active decision with your robot, you're not just like hoping that it'll hold on and not break. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the rise of kit parts, the, the rise of more reliable parts, again, we're like literally we're playing with like literal parts from toys, right? Um, you know, the machines are much more, uh, much more robust. The, basically CNC has become so common, all machine shops do it. And so, you know, there's been like a real democratization of, of parts, like of custom parts as well. Plus 3D printing. 3D printing has, become, has gone from, like 3D printing was basically a joke at that point. And yeah. now 3D printing, you can make actual viable parts out of it. Every, like most teams have 3D printing capabilities. We have insane 3D printing capabilities. Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, so uh, did anyone try to block shots back then? I don't think so, just because it was- I don't recall. I mean, you basically, because you have a limited box to step start in, you have to go and like design uh, a machine, or design some sort of like elevator to, to block yeah, so it. I think, I think that game you weren't allowed to go up past your extension. I don't think. Is that what it was? Okay. I'm pretty sure it was just like, this is the box. This is always the box. Yeah, it was like a no goaltending rule, basically. Yeah. So I don't think it was really a thing that year. Yeah, but, I don't think it was allowed. But, okay. but defense was really a thing, especially like if for teams that um, shot in an open field or teams that even teams that shot on the ramp, sometimes teams would uh, leak, like try to keep them on there. Cause yeah. Uh, Cause again, it, it was somewhat challenging to orient the robot. If you didn't have a man, that was really, like, I think the biggest thing that killed us with, with the, with that generation of robot we, that we couldn't independently articulate the, the uh, you know, the shooter. Yeah. Or uh, shoot from a fixed spot. Like we had no, we were just like, okay, we shoot from, I guess this spot. Hopefully we get there. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then <laughs> we have nothing scale. telling us if we're there or not, other than if this ball goes in sometimes. Yeah. It would even be in the spot, and you don't even know because the ball missed for another reason. As something clever that was developed in future years was teams would actually put flashlights on the robot. So it's like 
if the flash looked like a really intense. Oh, so you could tell where the robot's oriented? Yeah, so in 2016, we had that on our robot, and we could tell when we were the right distance and right, uh, left to right alignment. Oh, that is cool. That's like, cool. yeah, it's like a real, like a ghetto light or ghetto uh, range finder, basically. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, a lot of teams use it as a redundancy. You know, you have your working CV, but you just put it on there. CV breaks, whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, That's pretty cool. you know, someone's hitting you and you don't have, you know, CV might take a little t bit of time. You can just rely on this to get a quick shot off. Um, okay, that's that's all I you know had to talk about. Um, if there are no more ch questions from the chat, I don't think there are. Uh, thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks Paul. for having me. Uh, this was really great. Uh, yeah. I think it's really interesting. I hope you know the people in the video and people who are going to watch later enjoy it. And um, we'll be, hopefully, be back next week with another one of these. And I might ask you to come on for a future one too, Paul. Yeah, just, yeah. Let me know. This is fun. All right. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, nice meeting you guys. Um, Paul, you don't have to log off. I'm going to stop the recording.